Welcome to Healing Your Families. What power do you suppose there is that's strong enough to actually change lives? That's going to be our topic for this next month. Our theme is education. And as the mother of adult children and a retired school teacher, I can tell you that education has the power to change lives. It has the power to help people turn around and make changes and learn new skills and better ways of doing things. It has the power to help someone improve their economic situation. And naturally, as parents, we want the best education possible for our children. Remember our overall goal is to raise adults to help our children to become independent, successful, to believe in themselves, to set and reach lofty goals, to make their own decisions, think for themselves, and contribute and give back to society. And it requires education to do that. Well, a few years ago, I wrote the book, Navigating the Educational System, Five Strategies to Get the Best for Your Child. And it's about education and the role that parents can play in making sure their child gets the best education possible. The one that's going to enable them to live the life of their dreams, to reach their goals. Now remember that, first of all, you are your child's first teacher. They learn most from your example. They're watching you. They're aware of how much you read. They know when you talk ex about things you've learned and how rewarding it is to learn. They see how you treat other people, how you interact, how you solve problems, and how you manage your emotions. Be aware that you are your child's first teacher. And quite often, in, in addition to your example, it's your words, the words you use. You teach them to believe in themselves, to have high self-esteem, how to, to set goals and reach them. You, set, you teach them how to interact with others, how to get along and be a peacemaker. And reading. When you read to them, you do several things. You create a bond. It's a shared activity. You, by giving your most precious commodity your time, you're communicating, you're teaching to them, you're teaching them that you love them, you care about them, you value them. And then you're sharing that message in the book, whatever it is, that time is precious, the example is invaluable, and the concepts in the book are very effective. Later on, we'll be talking to an author who believes in the power of books to help children learn better behavior. So when you read to your children, when you talk to them, when you interact, something as simple as even if they're just sitting in a high chair, but you're fixing dinner and you're talking about what you're fixing and why you're choosing the food you choose. You're explaining where you like to keep your car keys so they're easy to find. You're demonstrating how to have effective orga organizational skills. That interaction, those interactions, that communication with your children from an early age is their first instruction. You are their first teacher. Now, I would like to look at a, the history of education. And in the United States, and I am thinking it is somewhat similar in other nations as well, 
and the education of children began as entirely the parents responsibility they taught their children how to read and write how to take over the family business run the farm take care of themselves cook the food and maintain a home if they could afford it they hired tutors to come in and teach additional skills they didn't have teach them other languages or if they weren't able to read and write they would try to find someone who did know how who could teach their children over time parents began to within their community share resources and work together the parents would build a schoolhouse and hire a school teacher and they would even set the time uh, for the school year in agricultural communities the school year began right after the harvest and it ended just before planting season it made sense and the parents made all of the decisions as to what would be taught in the school, how it would be taught. Then over time, local governments began assuming that responsibility and then eventually state governments and now the federal government. What we have, the public school system we have now is a curriculum based model in other words, the emphasis is on the curriculum, which is written by the federal government. And then because the federal government is providing the funding, the states, the communities follow their guidelines to get that funding. Now, this has some advantages because when it was just left to families or communities, Education was very disparate. There would be some wealthy families who could afford to have well-educated children and some illiterate families who struggled to just teach their children how to read and write. So when the federal government took over, this made this more equitable. There was a more consistent level of education in all states. So there, that is a good advantage. The drawback is parents were further removed from the educational decisions. Now, in every community in the United States, there is a local public school that parents can send their children to. And it's very convenient if the, if the school isn't close enough for the child to, to walk to, transportation is provided. All the parents need to do is get the child ready, send supplies, get them to the bus stop or remind them when it was time to walk to school. And for many, especially working parents, this is really a convenient setting. And parents have that opportunity to become involved in the school to attend and support their children in any of the activities, to get to know the teachers, to work with them. This is important. A lot of research has been done on what is the best setting, what helps children learn most effectively. And obviously it's when parents and school personnel are communicating and they're working together they're on the same page. What the children learn are learning in the school is supported at home. And when that setting exists and the child doesn't have any learning, dif dif learning disabilities, they make great progress. They're good socialization. They're going to school with the friends that they play with. And this is a really good, valuable option. It works for a majority of families. However, in your quest to get the best possible, possible situation for your children, you need to be aware of options. Bear in mind that the local public school is one option. I 
taught as a special ed teacher for 23 years. For 23 of my 24 years as a teacher, I worked with students with special needs. And even though special ed programs are effective, there's federal funding available to make them effective. But children are unique. They have special needs. And sometimes that public school setting doesn't work for them for whatever reason. It's not addressing their unique needs. And this is when it's good to know the options. In many communities, there are charter schools. Now, a charter school is a public school. It receives public funding. But it has a specific focus. And the charter dictates the objectives they will meet. And if they don't meet them, the school is closed. They no longer receive funding. Uh, I taught at a charter school for a year with the focus of teaching languages. So starting from kindergarten, children were taught Chinese, Spanish, Hawaiian, uh, Italian, French. There were several languages that were taught there and they started learning them in kindergarten. My grandchildren went to a charter school with a focus on technology. They started kindergarten in front of a computer. They were learning how to use a computer, how to program a computer. For any children who had an interest in a career in computers, they had an excellent start. So be aware of the charter schools that might be available. There might be one in your community that matches the needs and interest of your child. Now, the drawback is charter schools don't provide transportation. You will need to drive your child there or form a carpool. But if your child, if you're, you're struggling finding something that motivates your child and you can find a charter school with a speci that specializes in their interest, it could solve a lot of headache and heartache when it comes to time to go to school. You know, talking about motivation, again, as the mother of adult children and a retired school teacher, I can tell you every student is motivated. They may not be motivated on the curriculum that is being presented to them, but they are motivated to have their needs met, to reach their goals. Think about it. If a child were truly unmotivated, they would still be lying in a crib crying to be fed. But they were motivated enough to learn how to get out of the crib, how to walk, how to talk, how to communicate their needs. When students are able to focus on something that motivates them, there are no behavior problems. In addition to charter schools, there are also private schools. And some of them are run and operated by nonprofit organizations. So they keep their the tuition cost as low as possible. Their, their mission is to provide this methodology to as many parents as possible. I had the opportunity to visit a school like this. It used the Sudbury model. Now there are many different methodologies for instruction. I mentioned before that in our public school system, we use a curriculum driven method of teaching. So the federal government writes this curriculum, sends it to the states and the local the dis school districts and the local schools and it has an exact description of the learning objectives that each grade is to learn within that school year and pressure is applied to the teachers in some cases their 
pay raise is dependent on how successfully their students do on the end of level test. At the end of the school year, the students are tested on the items in that curriculum, that federally mandated curriculum. And so the focus moves from the student to the curriculum. Again, maybe that's perfect for your child. You, you want them to master that curriculum. And so this meets what you feel is best for their education. But if you, if you don't feel good about that, let me tell you about the Sudbury model. This is a student directed curriculum. And the Sudbury Valley School was founded in 1968 in Framingham, Massachusetts by a community of people and with the intention of creating a school system that was just psychologically comfortable self-governing with real life being the primary source of learning. So in this model, the curriculum centers around the child. At, it goes K through 12, kindergarten through end of high school. And <coughs> the children are encouraged to pursue their interest. What are they interested in learning? It could be arts. It could be studying bugs out in the yard. It could be making things with their hands. It could be learning to cook. Whatever their interest is, they are encouraged to pursue it. They are provided with the resources to go deeper and learn more. And the natural consequence is that they learn to read. They want to be able to read more about it. They learn to write. They're asked to write about what they learn. They learn communication skills. They need to present on what they've learned and, and teach other people. And by pursuing their interest, they also, most interests include math. You have to have some way of measuring it, of projecting. So all of the subjects fall naturally into their study as they pursue their interest. And the school I visited was in Lehigh in the state of Utah. It was called the Alpine Valley Academy. And it was founded by Mark Clough, a former member of the State Board of Education in Utah. He had heard about the Sudbury model, was very intrigued with it. So he traveled to Massachusetts. He visited the schools. He talked to the people who had founded it. And he brought it back to Utah and started a private school, a nonprofit. And it was very interesting. They were simply renting a large house with a massive yard. So it was a perfect setting for a child to pursue. They had plenty of room to pursue whatever they were interested in. I had the opportunity to talk to some of the students and to hear how by being able, by being allowed to pursue their interest, their subject, they were learning all of the skills they needed. I met one young student with severe ADHD. He had been in a traditional school before then and struggled. He couldn't comply with the rules and expectations. He was constantly getting into trouble. He was miserable. He was making everyone around him miserable. But in that setting where he was given permission to pursue his interests, he didn't have to sit quietly at a desk. He could run around in the yard. He was thriving. His behavior problems disappeared. And it was more than just the subject matter. They also, I attended their student body discussions. It was held on a consistent basis. I believe it was once a week. And the students 
design the rules and structure of the school. And they would meet every week to discuss what was going well, what needed improvement. Had someone broken one of the rules, what needed to be done? How could this be addressed so that the student could improve and order in the school could be maintained? So they were also learning leadership skills, how to lead a meeting, how to negotiate, how to communicate their needs, how to get along, and how to solve problems. I was very impressed with what I saw there. And you may wonder, now it's been around, this model has been around since 1968, and surveys have been done, so what happens to a student who goes to a school like this? Never having any curriculum imposed on them, simply allowed to choose what they wanted to learn. Did they go on to college? Could they ever get and hold a job? I want to read to you. This is from an article called Sudbury Schools, a radical alternative to No Child Left Behind. And this is telling about a study by the Sudbury Valley School. It was published in 2005. It took an in-depth look at the lives of Sudbury graduates and found that most students reported a high degree of satisfaction with their subsequent career and life paths. Close to 90% went on to pursue formal education, whether it was vocational or junior college or university, 90% continued their studies beyond the 12th grade. And many eventually went on to become entrepreneurs or to work in the arts. It brought out their creative side. According to Mimsy Sadowski, one of the founders of the Sudbury Valley School, every student who has wished to has been able to attend college. They are going on to college because they want to, not just because it's what many feel is the next step for an 18-year-old. They are going on to higher education in general because they have something they want to pursue that is easier to pursue in that setting. Again, your focus is on the best interest of your child. I love this approach for one of the other options parents have is homeschool. They can educate their children themselves. It is perfectly legal. I did this myself. My husband and I, as our oldest child approached kindergarten age, took a look at the local public school and were very concerned. We lived in a big city. The school was across a major thoroughfare. We talked to students and parents who attended. We realized the school had many challenges. We were concerned. We did not feel like that was a safe place for our child. We looked into private schools. The nearest one was 20 miles away. And then we learned about homeschool, about parents who write their own curriculum and teach their children themselves. And we determined to do that. Now, eventually we moved from the city to a more rural area and we worked with the public school. So they knew what we were doing and they understood our goals and our concerns. And at times they would even share materials with us. Eventually, at one point, all of our children did attend public school. For example, our oldest son did very well with homeschool. But when he started high school, he was able to be in the school band. He was able to have experiences in that setting that he couldn't have had in a home school. So I felt like we were able to give them the best of both worlds, that personalization 
of homeschool and we took it each case separately and determined when it was best for this child to go to public school or some other arrangement. That's what, that's your opportunity as a parent. You can make those decisions for your children. Frequently when parents meet with school officials, they're somewhat intimidated by the long list of letters after the name and they think, well, I, I, I just graduated high school. This person has advanced degrees. Maybe I may just do what they say. But who knows your child better than you do? Who is totally committed to their welfare and their success, not just for the school year, but for the rest of their life? No one else but you has the commitment to your child, can, is better equipped to take the role of an advocate for your child than you are. So whatever setting you choose for your child, you have that opportunity to be actively involved in the process. Now, this doesn't mean pulling a Karen. That's what we say in the United States to someone who's very bossy and overbearing. Wh which do you respond more favorably to? Appreciation or criticism? Everyone responds much more favorably to appreciation than criticism. So when you go and meet with whoever the school setting is, whoever else is part of your team to educate your child, begin with gratitude. Tell them what you appreciate about the school, about what the teacher is doing. And then take the objective view of let's problem solve. I'm concerned about this issue. How can we work together to address this issue? No blaming, no calling names, no avoid the adversary. Work together. Anytime you can bring the focus on the best interest of your child, your child wins. I've seen it happen over and over again. I want, a, you can get a digital copy of my book, Navigating the Educational System, at the Win Win store, along with products from other show hosts. I would also like to encourage you to go to 5valuesforfamilies.com. At this site, you, I have, I've recorded a 25-minute webinar that you can watch at your convenience, and it provides specific tools that will help to strengthen and heal your family. Every family, you know, right now I feel like families are under attack, and it's, it's much more difficult I think parents today face challenges no previous generation ever had to deal with. I wanted to offer something concrete and solid for parents. So please go check that out. It's complimentary. It will give you some valuable tools that will help you in, in providing what's best for your family. And then, of course, go to my website, HealingYourFamilies.com, learn more about the other resources I have for parents. We, as I said, this week we'll be talking more about education. Next week we'll be talking to an author who wrote books to help children manage their emotions. It's very fascinating. So come back again next week at the same time, same place. Until then, love yourself and love your families. We're making the world a better place by strengthening families, one family at a time. This is Emily Penrod 
from HealingYourFamilies.com.